Good evening, everybody. What a great crowd. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Frances Lippman, and I'm here on behalf of the Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society. And we are a proud supporting um, promotional partner of this event. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge we are on the territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, and we give thanks for the wisdom and the stewardship passed down since time eternal. We have much to learn. Our intention is to embody reconciliation in all that we do, as we want to be a united, healthy, and happy community. We're um, honored to be living in this territory, and this tour, just so you have a, a little background, is the result of a collaborative effort by green volunteers from across uh, the Lower Mainland, Salt Spring Island, and Vancouver Island. We've put partisan as partisanship aside because of the reality of corporate uh, capture is not a green issue. It's an issue that affects each and every one of us. It's true. <laughs> a number of independent organizations have stepped up to help promote this tour, and you'll note their logos on the back of your program. And we have a table set up at the back um, in behind here where we offer some print materials from these promotional partners. And as well, Kevin Taft's books are back there, so you're not going to want to miss that. And uh, Kevin will be unveiling uh, the truth behind what's holding us back, a theme that's uh, common to the Green Party list, to focusing on what's happening, what's really happening. And thank goodness we have somebody here who can tell us as well, which I'll introduce in a moment, who uh, knows what's going on behind the scenes. And there will be a national convention coming up at the latter part of this month in Vancouver. You'll hear more about that. And um, you might want to check out some of those sessions. And now, without any further ado, I could go on and on about Elizabeth May, but we want to have time for questions. So I'd like to introduce Canada's most hardworking MP, Order of Canada recipient, and your M at the MP for Saanich Gulf Islands to introduce our speaker, Kevin Taft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's always lovely to see Francis again. Francis and I have been creatively united for a long time. And, uh, we're, and I also join her in, in thanking uh, the Esquimalt Songhees and also Saanich Nation and say, Haishka Siam. We hold our hands up to the Indigenous people who have stewarded this lands and these waters for so long. I have a couple of happy duties. I'm supposed to just be, according to Thomas, I'm just supposed to be introducing Kevin, but I have a few other things first. So uh, one thing is, uh, we're a month out from Thanksgiving, a little less than a month out. So some beautiful volunteers who are now going to stand, so you can see them, boop it up. These two lovely ladies are going to be standing outside those doors when you leave. Don't blame them that this is a plastic bag. It's not a single-use item plastic bag. It will be used over and over. It's for the food bank, for the BC Thanksgiving food drive. All the information you need is stapled to the bag. So be sure to grab one from them so that we can have the most successful BC Thanksgiving food drive ever. So find them and take a bag. I also wanted to tell you the story of how a five location, it's hard to call it a five city speaking tour since one of the places was Ganges. I noticed the website says five cities, one message. And I think Ganges is, hard, you know, but never mind. Five locations, one message, one incredible speaker, a real champion for democracy. And I came across Kevin Taft's book. Oil's Deep State, and knowing that the Green Party Convention was focused on a message, which, I, which we crafted as 
time for the truth about democracy, about global corporate rule, about climate change. And I thought, he's the ideal speaker. And the ideal speaker convinced me that he wasn't available uh, on the dates of our convention, which I will say, although if you're not a Green Party member, this is not partisan. If you want to come for just a one session, you can buy a ticket to one session or whatever and show up in Vancouver. It's going to be cool. I'd love to see you there. But, but we won't see Kevin there. So I said, okay, well, he had other plans. And I said, all right, can't we get you to come to Sydney? That's my first thought was we could come into Saanich Gulf Islands. We've got a lot of wonderful people there who'd love to hear your message. And then I said, well, he, he said, well, I could consider that. So then I, I did the inevitable thing. I, I passed it on to wherever he's gone, Thomas Toyvin. Where did you go, Thomas? Who was up here earlier checking the mic? Thomas, there. And I said, oh, Thomas, can you organize a speaking event for Kevin Taft? Which turned into a speaking tour. This is the fourth night. Kevin Taft has been speaking at events organized completely by volunteers in West Vancouver, Vancouver, Salt Spring Island, and tonight here in Victoria, and then on to Courtney. So I couldn't be more pleased, and I just want to thank Thomas and all the volunteers who put this together from the bottom of my heart, because this is an amazing experience of five locations coming together to hear a message that Canadians need to hear. So thank you, Thomas, and all the volunteers. So I won't go on and on. I'm going to be able to come back up here later. As you can see from the two chairs, the idea is that after Kevin presents, I'll be able to sit in conversation with him for about 15 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. Uh, just to you know that Kevin Taft is the former leader of the Liberal Party in Alberta. And whenever I think of it, I think for all the people who say to me, aren't you tired of crying in the wilderness? I think, well, it could be worse. I could be the leader of the Liberal Party in Alberta. <laughs> I, like, it had to be lonely work. And he did have more company than I do, so I'm just being a bit facetious. But he was a member of the Legislative Assembly in Alberta from 2001 to 2012, and leader of the party there for 2004 to 2008, and did amazing work in really looking at the economy of Alberta and deciding what would be best, how to advance solutions that would make sense. Before that, he had a long career in public policy work. Uh, and I just want to highlight one thing. As a defender of our public health care system and against privatized medicine, that's another part of Kevin's background that you might not know. But even more obscure, earlier than that, 86 to 91, he led an expedition to look for dinosaur, but, well, it's a paleontology expedition, in China's Gobi Desert and the Alberta Badlands. So I, I won't say anything about the political class that might have fit in that, that search for dinosaurs, but I will say <laughs> that it's an enormous honor and a privilege, and I'm extremely grateful that Kevin Taft has come here to British Columbia to share a message about what's really going on in oil's deep state. Thank you. Welcome, Kevin Taft. I guess I should say thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Um, and actually, I owe a bunch of thank yous. I, I want to repeat, Elizabeth's thank you to the volunteers who have worked so hard tonight. Uh, this room is, is, the church is almost completely full because of the efforts of volunteers. And as Elizabeth has said, I've been on the road, uh, though this is the fourth, the fifth presentation in four days that I've done. Every single step of the way has been arranged and organized by volunteers, and it has gone absolutely flawlessly. Uh, volunteers, this will sound like I'm doing a pitch for volunteers, but volunteers like the ones who have helped tonight uh, change the world. And we're going to, you know, the world doesn't change easily and it doesn't change very much, 
but it'll shift just a tiny bit because of the great work of all the volunteers here. So I want to repeat Elizabeth's thank you to the organizers. I, um, I also want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Very large crowd, which uh, you're, you're, you're a very intelligent, kind of a formidable looking group, so I'll... I'll uh, do my best. I hope I live up to your standards. Last night I was in Ganges, the uh, metropolis, is that what it is? The metropolis of Ganges. And a number of people pointed out that they had a decision to make between staying home and harvesting their zucchini or coming out to see me. So <laughs> last night I rated above a zucchini. I hope, uh, I hope I do that again tonight. Um, I also understand this is being live streamed, is that right, Thomas? So this is being live streamed to a number of remote locations. And uh, to each one of those locations, I understand maybe Whistler and Duncan and Seychelles and perhaps others. Uh, wherever you are, um, glad you can tune in. So let's get down to business. How many of you listen occasionally or maybe even frequently to the CBC Ideas? program. A lot of hands go up. Uh, I struggled with how long this presentation should be because I'm an impatient man and I like things that are short and succinct but it kept getting larger and finally I said I'm just going to relax and pretend it's a CBC Ideas program. So you're all welcome to do the same thing. It'll run a little bit, you know, 45 or 50 minutes. The only catch is that uh, when I listen to CBC Ideas I'm often lying down and then I you know where this is going because you do it till you fall asleep. So uh, if you fall asleep tonight, I'll forgive you. <laughs> Our topic, global warming and democracy. Now, these are two, I two ideas that are not automatically connected uh, right off the surface. People might think of global warming and wildfires, for example, or global warming and, and emissions. They might think of democracy and money or democracy and politics. I want you to understand by the end of tonight about the close link between global warming and democracy. So that's uh, what I'm trying to achieve here. It's not, a, it's not a link that was necessarily strong early in my mind, uh, but I was prompted to, uh, to think about it. I won't go into the background of why I ended up writing this book, but um, there's a, whoops, sorry, I'm forgetting. Laura, there we are. There's actually, uh, uh, system between me and a person operating the slides that I forgot about. So these images will come up on your screen and I have to just remember to remind Laura. Um, so the ideas I'm going to talk tonight largely stem from from a book that's been mentioned a couple of times. This is not a book tour event, this is just about raising, raising issues, um, but the issues as I've thought about them are reflected in the book. And I came to write the book, just my background very briefly, aside from searching for dinosaurs in China, I'm not actually a paleontologist, I was helping to run that, and I then realized it was in fact great qualification for dealing with the conservatives in the, <laughs> in the uh, Alberta legislature. I worked a, a couple of decades, the first part of my career in and around the provincial government in various uh, capacities, and there are actually a couple of former colleagues from some of that work here tonight. I then returned, and that gave me some insight of how government on the inside works at the civil service and regulatory level. I then went and did a PhD in business. People think, oh well that's marketing or finance or something. I was actually way, way off on the fringes of organizational theory looking at trying to understand how society sustains, organizes itself to sustain mass consuming. And that just led me to look at society a little bit differently through some theory and so on. And then it, my wife calls me the accidental politician. Uh, I won't go into the story, but I did end up serving three full terms in the Alberta legislature, including um, almost five years as leader of the opposition through two general elections and we went up in one and then down in the next and that's as much as I could take of politics. Uh, but that, through my time as the leader of the opposition in Alberta, we were the alternate government. There are people here who were working with me on that project and I met 
several times a week with the most powerful people in Canada's oil industry, executives, board directors, senior managers, and so on. And that gave me a sense, first of all, these are, these are real human beings, very bright, capable, accomplished human beings. Um, show of hands, how many people here have lived in Alberta? Okay. <laughs> so all of us know that the oil industry has brought a lot of prosperity to Alberta and indeed a lot of prosperity to Canada. So I don't see any value in demonizing uh, the, the people who work in the industry, but we do need to come to a change. Anyways, I got a sense from my position there of the incredible muscle, the wealth, the determination, the ability of that industry and how it likes to get its own way. So that's what's informing my topic tonight. Laura, let's... So, first half, global warming. I'm going to start off with the big picture, which is also a photograph of my home. Uh, you can see up there, if you click the slide, planet Earth. That's the home of me and you and everybody who's ever lived. And that's really the big picture. We are talk about, talking about global warming, which affects every square centimeter of the planet. Next. And that, uh, that planet, which looks so big when we're standing on the edge of the ocean or walking you know, below the mountains, from outer space, it's actually just, as Carl Sagan called it, just a small blue dot. And we are changing the nature of that small blue dot through our activities. Wrapped around planet Earth is this thin layer of atmosphere, the air that we breathe literally every moment that we're alive. There's almost a definition that equates breathing air and life. If Earth were the size of a basketball, the breathable part of the atmosphere would be a, a single sheet of paper wrapped around that basketball. And through our activities over the last couple of hundred years, we have changed the nature of that atmosphere. We effectively use the atmosphere, to put it bluntly, as a sewer. We use, we use it as a carbon dump. All the smoke that comes out of our chimneys and the tailpipes and everything else, it's just, it's just, we don't even think about it. It's gone, we don't pay for it, it's just gone into the atmosphere. But what we've been doing, in reality, is taking vast, vast amounts of carbon, hydrocarbons, coal and oil and natural gas, from deep underground where they've been sealed safely away for tens and hundreds of millions of years. And in a geological blink of an eye, we've brought them to the surface of the earth and we've burned them. Burned them in vast amounts. Today, September 12th, a uh, hundred million barrels of oil, plus or minus one, one million, will have been burned uh, about uh, more than 10 million tons of coal will have been burned today, 300 billion cubic feet today. The same as yesterday, the same tomorrow. It goes on every day of the year. And so, because of that, all, that, all those emissions have to go somewhere. I mean, it's, it's absolutely common sense. It's physical reality. You can literally watch this play out when you look at a chimney and the smoke goes up a chimney. All those emissions are going into our atmosphere. And a big chunk of those emissions are carbon dioxide, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about uh, as the greenhouse gas tonight. So this is one of only two graphs. If you can see it. Nope. Whoa. <laughs> there we go. Uh, one of only two graphs. So if you hate graphs, you're already halfway through the pain tonight. This is produced by one of the uh, most important U.S. government uh, science agency, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's not, you're not getting a great image on these screens, but on the left-hand side, at the bottom, it starts about the year 1700. And as you go across the bottom from left to right, it ends about two weeks ago. And what the shaded area shows you is the rising proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Some of you will have seen this graph. This is, I won't go into the background of it. Through the, f when we began a couple of hundred years ago, there are about 270 or so parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it stays at that level right into the 1800s. And if you went the other way, if you could travel backwards through time, it would stay in the range of 250 parts per million for 
at least 800,000 years and almost certainly millions of years before it. It stays in a very narrow range. Then we start burning coal. You see the gradual slope upwards. About the midpoint of that graph is 1850. And then we enter the age of oil. And you can see how rapidly the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide rises. So today, the air we breathe, instead of being 250 million parts of carbon dioxide, is at 250 parts per million carbon dioxide is now over 400. So you might look at me and say, well, parts per million? Come on, that's so tiny it doesn't matter. I won't tell tales on anybody, but let's imagine somebody in this room had a glass of wine at supper tonight. If you have, depending on your body mass, a glass of wine over the course of an hour or so, your blood alcohol level roughly is about 250 parts per million. You probably don't feel it. Your, your biology will have shifted a little bit. If you have two glasses of wine over that hour, let's say it's a really good time, well, you will start to feel that. You'll, your blood pressure will change. You'll speak a little more loudly. You'll feel a little better. You might flush in the face. Essentially, your blood alcohol level would be at about what the carbon dioxide level is in the atmosphere today, oh, somewhere over 400 parts per million. It's like we've given the atmosphere an extra glass of wine, and its behavior is starting to change. Laura? That's a photo of planet Earth. You might say, well, why is it changing? What's the carbon dioxide have to do with it? Photo of planet Earth taken with an ordinary camera, and this is an image of planet Earth taken with an infrared camera, and you can go one more along. Laura, there we go. That's just a Mercator projection, so I don't know how, how clearly you can see that, but the dark, dark red across Sahara and India and so on, that's where the Earth is radiating a whole tremendous amount of infrared energy, entirely natural processes. Earth is out there dangling out there, that little blue dot in space absorbing all kinds of energy from the sun, and it radiates it all back out as infrared, entirely natural. When, uh, when the hand of God passes through space, uh, and I checked, I googled this, it's minus 270 Celsius in space. Even for a guy from the prairies, that's really cold. <laughs> and when the hand of God passes over Earth, God thinks to herself, that's pleasantly warm. And that's why we can live here, because there's a wrapping of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. But by adding all kinds of extra carbon dioxide, we've changed things because infrared energy is absorbed by carbon dioxide. And that causes the carbon dioxide to warm up. The physics are the same as when you put a mug in the microwave oven. You hit it for a minute, those microwaves come out of a, at a particular wavelength, they pass through the glass and they heat up the coffee. And you have a cool cup and hot coffee. In the same way, infrared energy is just a different wavelength. It passes through the oxygen and nitrogen in the air, but it heats up the carbon dioxide, just like microwave energy heats up coffee. And so by adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, Laura, we have caused more infrared energy to be absorbed, which is causing the atmosphere to warm. This is uh, the second and final graph. It's a little harder to read. This is put out by NASA, the people who send astronauts into space. And across the bottom, from left to right, it starts at the year 1880, and it goes to last year. And that just shows, it's a, a graph of the uh, average surface temperature on the planet Earth. And you can see generally, the generally and very distinct upward motion in global temperature. So that's exactly what the physicists would predict, and it's playing out exactly that way. Next, Laura. This is an issue that has a really long history to it. The science of this has been roughly understood for well over 100 years. By 1965, so more than 50 years ago, the Science Advisory Council to Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, wrote a paper that he made public. 
in which these eminent scientists warned that we are conducting, as they put it, an unwitting experiment with our atmosphere by burning fossil fuels that add carbon dioxide. And they predicted in 1965, melting glacial ice caps, rising ocean levels, more extreme weather, and all these other things that we are now living with today. So the reality is playing out as the science uh, predicted. A couple of points, I'm not going to linger here, you didn't come for a science lesson, but there is a reason I'm spending time on the science, and that is that there has been tens and hundreds of millions of dollars spent over the last 25 years to cause us to doubt the science, to feel uncertain about the science. The last key points here, which start leading us into the issue of democracy, carbon dioxide is a really, really stable chemical. It lasts in the atmosphere for centuries. So I got a ride here tonight in a car, gasoline burning car, many of us will have the carbon dioxide that came out of that tailpipe will still be in the atmosphere, most of it, 500 years from now. What this means is that carbon dioxide accumulates. It's building up day by day by day. We cannot cheat the laws of physics. We can't just cut our emissions in half and think we've solved it because that half will still build up on every other day. We have to, over the next couple of decades, figure out how to bring our carbon dioxide and fossil fuel emissions to zero. And what that means is the fossil fuel industry has to be phased out. Now, I say that in Alberta, and usually I'm ducking tomatoes by this point, but that's what the physics dictates. And uh, that's what sets up what I see as a collision with democracy. Laura? The industry actually through, and this is well documented and I explained this in, in my book with lots of examples, the industry poured millions of dollars into studying this problem starting shortly after that 1965 paper was published through the 1970s. Exxon was one of the leaders that poured tremendous money into research and supported clear, solid scientific work that's uh, that I describe in the book. And I just pull one quote for the slides tonight for those who maybe can't read the, the print on the slides. This is from the American Petroleum Institute. Remember that name, I'll come back to them. These are from internal documents and they, this, is, this was occurring in a boardroom filled with oil executives, a boardroom rented at LaGuardia Airport and they had their own scientists reporting to this group of executives and you can read, I spent some time on this particular presentation in my book because the scientists go through the science. They use a phrase that turns up repeatedly in the oil industry's own research, scientific consensus, words like unanimous agreement. There was no doubt here. And this particular presentation ends with the words globally catastrophic effects. Their own scientists we're predicting by later this century, if nothing is done, there will be globally catastrophic effects. The industry knew 30 years ago what was up. And they also understood the implications of this. Uh, this is just a quick sample, I won't dwell on this. This is from Exxon. Clearly, if you're sitting there running a fossil fuel company and you're told, well, the only way we can reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions or carbon dioxide emissions is by using less fossil fuels. Well, that's bad news for fossil fuel companies. They had a choice. We always have a choice. They had a choice at that point. They could have chosen to say, okay, we're, we're sophisticated scientists. We accept the science. We're going to redefine our company from a, an oil company to an energy company, and we're going to pour our, all our incredible resources into solar and wind, and we are not going to put the earth at risk of globally catastrophic effects. Wouldn't that have been nice? Instead, the industry doubled down. They began uh, every, doing everything they could to expand production and profits, and um, they set up what I call a hyper-cynical campaign 
to confuse the public about what was really going on. So this sets up a collision with democracy, and you could choose different dates for the point of impact. I choose 1982. How many of you remember uh, the Rio Earth Summit? Anybody remember that? Yeah, a lot of hands. I knew it was a sophisticated crowd. The Rio Earth Summit in 1992 was the largest gathering of, gathering of heads of state in history until that time. Well over 100 heads of state, tens of thousands of other people. Elizabeth, did you go there? Okay, I'm not surprised. Tens of thousands of other people convened in Rio in 1992 to sign a series of environmental treaties, one of which was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which committed all the signatories to reduce emissions. And it also set up a process that led to the Kyoto discussion, remember the Kyoto Protocol, and even the Paris uh, Accord a, a couple of years ago. At that point, it's very clear in history that the industry begins to strike back, and they have continued without relent. So let's go to democracy. I'm going to pause for a second. Next slide, Laura. How is everybody doing for temperature? Should we open a door here? Yes? Can you? Great, thank you. And I don't know if we can open a back door or something. Laura, can you bring up the next slide, please? So we're on to the second part here, democracy. There is an endless number of definitions of democracy. I thought, well, we have to have one for tonight, and I, I chose one that is succinct and poetic, and also reminds us that every so often there's a brilliant and courageous person in the White House as opposed to, I don't even know what adjective to use to, for, the, for the current president. This is uh, a phrase written by Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address, uh, we're not Americans, so this isn't part of our curriculum, but if you ever uh, have the chance, you can easily Google it. It's about 700 words long, and it is a, an astonishing piece of writing. You can read it in about four minutes. Abraham Lincoln, I understand he wrote it on his way to speak at the, uh, at the site. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. And that's as good a definition of democracy as we need. But of course, that doesn't happen automatically. It certainly wasn't happening uh, easily when Abraham Lincoln spoke those words. It's actually a radical idea. Throughout all of history, very, very few societies have anything close to the democracy we have now. Being people living under kings or queens or empires or occupying armies or what have you. The opportunity we have in a democracy right now is rare and it's worth fighting for. How do we achieve it? How does it happen? Well, it happens not just by going out and voting every so often, although that's really important. There's so much more to democracy than that. Democracy requires a whole series of autonomous institutions. What do I mean by that? Well, social organizations that have at their core a public mandate, a public interest mandate, as opposed to a private interest mandate of a corporation. And these institutions need to be pretty well defined. They need to be, uh, they need to have rules and they need to have uh, procedures and customs and barriers that give them a clear role, what they can do and what they can't do. What do I mean? I led one of those for five years, the opposition. Opposition parties are an institution of democracy. They have, I stepped into that role, I got briefed on what I could do and what I couldn't do and what the procedures were and what you can say and what you can't say and I was given resources but it was very clearly defined what my role was. Across the floor was a different institution, the governing party. They had a bigger job than I did. They also had a lot more to do it with but clearly defined. Outside uh, and you know in Ottawa down the block, the courts the court system, which revealed how important they are just a couple of weeks ago with a court decision. The courts stand apart. They have a very clear role with a public interest mandate at its core, but they are, they are uh, well-defined. Justin Trudeau could not have picked up the phone to the Federal Court of Appeal and said, I think you should rule this way. Um, 
a well-defined role. Regulators, another institution, energy regulators. Uh, regulators control all kinds of our lives. The National Energy Board, have you heard of the National Energy Board? Yeah. And independent media, universities, and so on and on. All of these institutions have a role to play in the public interest that's well-defined, and they are part of a system where they keep each other in check, and there's a counterbalancing, so that the opposition party counterbalances the governing party. The courts, as we saw so clearly, counterbalance the governing party and the regulator. The civil service, I didn't mention, but the civil servants today are professionals, it's supposed to be nonpartisan, and they are prevented from taking uh, incentives, shall we call it, from the private sector. They're there as another institution. And all, always at the core is this notion as, of government of the people, by the people, for the people. So I, oops, sorry, okay, nope, go forward. One more, Laura. So this is just a really simple graphic presentation. So I could have done, uh, you know, rings and rings and rings around the outside. And this one, you can't see it necessarily. Sorry about the scale here. You have around that ring, the governing party, the opposition party, civil service, courts, universities, media, regulator, and always in the middle, the citizens. If this was a representation of Russia, There'd be a, a shirtless guy on a horse in the middle of that picture, Vladimir Putin and the oligarchs. That's the difference between a democracy and all kinds of other forms of government. But we are human beings. And so once in a while things go wrong, our institutions fail us. They are what the academics call captured. And there's quite a long history on capture. This is not a term I made up. Um, there's a history on regulatory capture that goes back almost a hundred years and on institutional capture. Essentially, what's been, uh, what capture means is that an institution that has a public mandate ends up losing track of that and serving a private mandate instead. And so, I bet a lot of you have cell phones, and every month you are paying some of the highest cell phone bills in, ca in the world. And every month when I do that, I think about the regulator of the cell phone industry, and I wonder, are those guys and men and women serving the public interest, or are they really more interested in the bottom lines of TELUS and Rogers and Bell and so on? Have they been captured? I don't know. But I argue that the oil industry has actually captured key institutions in our democracy. I cite a whole bunch of evidence for that, and I go one step further, Laura. I argue, um, okay, sorry, the slide, our slides, we're okay there, Laura, stay there for a minute. Um, just to summarize, key public institutions are captured by the oil industry when the interests of the oil industry in expanded production and profits have displaced what's clearly the public interest of avoiding globally catastrophic effects. So let's go to the next slide. I think something actually more than that has happened with the oil industry. The question that occurred to me, and I, I bore witness to this in Alberta, and then I, I, once I understood what I was looking for, I could see it happening all across the country in the United States. The question I asked is what happens when it's not just one institution captured, but what's happened when the governing party and the opposition party and the civil service and the regulators and the universities and maybe the media and who knows what other institutions have all been captured and are held by the same private interest. And I think at that point, that counterbalancing that I described earlier breaks down. And the capacity of democracy to serve the people is replaced by a state within a state, a state that's actually institution after institution serving the same private interest. And in this case, of course, as you know, I think that private interest 
is the oil industry. So that's what I'm calling oil's deep state. And just to keep putting up my simple effort at graphics, um, as simple as they are, that's just a different circle with institutions around the outside, the governing party, the regulator, and so on. And instead of the middle being occupied by citizens, it's occupied by the oil industry. And so let me give you some examples. Let me put, you some, put some meat on the bones here. So I'm going to read to you. Are you ready to be read to? Um, I'm going to read to you from Chelsea. I call this copy of my book, this specific individual copy, Chelsea. Do you want to know why? <laughs> Good. That's the right answer. So I launched this book, uh, or this book was launched by the publisher just under almost exactly a year ago. And the day of the launch came, and it was in Edmonton, and a large room had been booked, and we were expecting about 200 people, and there had been a delay at the printer. So the day of the launch was there, and I hadn't seen the book. I mean, I knew what it said, but I, I hadn't seen it. And that was a problem, but I also knew it had been shipped and it had arrived at Audrey's bookstore, which is the main, the, the last independent bookstore standing in, in Edmonton. So I raced down to Audrey's about noon hour, hoping to get a copy of this book, and the clerk behind the counter as I came up was rummaging through some boxes, and I said, excuse me, excuse me, I'm looking for a copy of a book that's probably just arrived called Oil's Deep State. And he said, oh, well, I'm just unpacking it right now. And I said, can I see a copy, please? And he said, sure. So he comes up from behind the counter and, and hands me a, co a copy of the book. And I, a bunch of you, I'm sure, have published books. This is actually my fifth book, but it doesn't matter how many books I publish. Everyone, it's like a newborn baby. <laughs> and the clerk hands me this book. And I'm thinking, I kind of, my eyes glaze over. <laughs> this, is, this is the most beautiful book in the world. <laughs> and then I think, this book is going to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I'm just lost in all these amazing, warm thoughts. And then I look up the clerk, and he's looking at me who is this guy? What's going on? So I, I think, wow, oh, you know, I wrote this book. I say to him, my name's Kevin Taft. And he says, oh, well, well that's nice. We'll give you 10% off. <laughs> that's exactly how it played out. So I paid for my copy of the book, and I knew this was the first ever copy of the book that had been sold. So this is a collector's item. This is going to end up in the National Library or it'll be worth thousands of dollars or something. So I go to the book launch that night. It goes well, really well, and at the end I'm, people want to buy the book. That's why you have a book launch. And so I'm signing away to, you know, to Tom, Dick, and Harry and so on. And then this young woman comes to the front of the line and I say, who would you, who would you like the book signed to? And she says, to Chelsea. Oh, great. So I say, to Chelsea, C-H-E-L-S-E-A. And as soon as I write the A, she goes, no, no, it's Y. So I can't give her a new copy of the book with her name misspelled on it. So I take the one that was going to be worth untold amounts of money, and I spell it out to Chelsea with a Y, and I give it to her, and I don't think I flinched visibly or anything, but that means now I've been stuck with a book made out to Chelsea <laughs> with an A ever since. In the next three or four book launches, I would ask, is anybody here named Chelsea because I have your book? <laughs> and nobody was, and now it's kind of dog-eared, and I'm quite fond of it, so I'm going to read to you from Chelsea to put some some details to all this theory. 
The book opens with a trial, an account of a trial, a, a man named Bruce Carson, who was put on trial in Ottawa. And if you Google Bruce Carson, you might get confused about the trial because he's been on trial quite a lot, it turns out. But this particular trial was for illegal lobbying. And Bruce Carson had been trained, was, is still trained as a lawyer, had worked his way up through the Conservative Caucus federally. And the day that Stephen Harper was sworn in as Prime Minister, did you ever meet Bruce Carson? No, no? okay. The day that Stephen Harper was sworn in as Prime Minister, Bruce Carson took a position in the Prime Minister's office as Stephen Harper's senior uh, advisor. He worked there for a couple of years and then he left Ottawa and took up two positions in Calgary. One heading up an institute on energy and environment at the University of Calgary. I see people wincing in the crowd. <laughs> well, they might. And the second position with a front organization for the industry called the Energy Policy Institute of Canada, EPIC. And from that position, he began lobbying back into the federal government. Well, you remember I talked about these boundaries that have to define an institution? There are rules about what you can and cannot do. Eventually, Bruce Carson was charged with illegal lobbying and found guilty. One of the many wonderful things about a democracy like Canada is when a trial is held, the evidence presented is public. So I was able to sift through hundreds of pages of documents that the police collected on this energy organization. Memos, emails, cancel checks, bank statements, contracts, and assemble a picture zeroing in in the back room of the oil industry. So I'm just gonna read, give you a sense of how EPIC came to be. It's not clear when the idea to form EPIC was hatched, but it did, it did not materialize out of thin air. Interests with serious intent and deep pockets pushed it into being. When its founding meeting was held on August 13th, 2009, a 20-page package of sophisticated bylaws was presented, which defined, among other things, the role of a strategic advisory board, and named Douglas Black as president. Douglas Black was subsequently appointed to the Senate by Stephen Harper, and Thomas DeKino and Bruce Carson as co-chairpersons. Thomas DeKino at the time was the head of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. We're talking about heavyweights here. Bruce Carson was the man on trial. The minutes for the meeting obtained by police noted that a preliminary budget of $2.9 million was reviewed. It was felt this was reasonable, but it was noted further review would occur. The minutes give no indication of who prepared the budget or where the 2.9 million would come from. At the meeting, Carson and D'Aquino were awarded honoraria of $60,000 a year, and Douglas Black was appointed president for a two-year term at $10,000 a month. EPIC's founding charter was finalized a month later on September 9th, 2009, exactly nine years ago. In an interview with RCMP during their investigation, DeKino explained that, quote, EPIC's goal was to develop an energy strategy for Canada, end quote. This is a goal of remarkable ambition. EPIC and its backers, primarily the oil industry, were not lobbying to change a particular policy or get support for a specific project. They weren't looking for a tax break or change in environmental standards. Their goal was to do something that would be led by national governments in other democracies. Develop an energy strategy, oil, gas, coal, electricity, nuclear, pipelines, renewables, for all of Canada. In effect, EPIC was founded with the ambition of capturing the energy policy of a nation with the oil industry de facto in a privileged position. And then I continue on. I wanted to read that to you because it gives you a sense of the scale of ambition, the way the oil industry thinks. They are thinking of themselves as roughly equivalent to government. They are taking on roles that normally would be undertaken by civil servants and regulators and political parties. 
Now, I'm going to go back in time, so that's about 10 years ago. I'm going to go back uh, several years before that. Do you remember there was a slide um, with the American Petroleum Institute? That was the one that, in which they were all briefed on the pending globally catastrophic effects of what they were doing. Well, the American Petroleum Institute decided to subvert all the public understanding of that issue. And the New York Times, uh, 20 years ago or so, actually exposed a communications plan. All of you have heard, I should almost ask, put up your hand if you haven't heard this, but put up your hand if, you, if you've heard people say, well, the science on global warming isn't settled. Have you, you've, everybody's heard that, everybody, all, everybody up in the balcony. That's being drilled into us because of a very deliberate, cynical, cynical policy starting more than 20 years ago. The New York Times published, uh, they were able to get a copy of the American Petroleum Institute's plan to do this. And so I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs just to give you a sense of the real specifics. Because, you know, I show you diagrams of theory, that plays out in reality. As part of its plan, the American Petroleum Institute had commissioned a study. This is in the lead up to the Kyoto, trying to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, so this is 20 years ago. The American Petroleum Institute had commissioned a study of public opinion that found most Americans thought climate change to be a great threat, but also found that if they were told that scientists did not think the evidence was clear, then a majority would come to oppose the Kyoto Treaty. Victory will be achieved, says the plan, when, quote, those promoting the Kyoto Treaty on the basis of science appear to be out of touch with reality. That's a bizarre, like that's Donald Trump sort of stuff. When those promoting the Kyoto Treaty on the basis of science appear to be out of touch with reality, the industry will have achieved victory. Reality, it seems, would be turned into fantasy and fantasy into reality. The strategies and tactics of the plan included recruiting scientists, quote, who do not have a long history in the climate change debate, to use as commentators sowing doubt on the global warming science. They would be supported by media information kits and orchestrated campaigns producing steady streams, that's their term, steady streams of letters to the editor, op-ed campaign or op-ed columns, workshops, and paid advertising on scientific uncertainties. You've almost certainly read some of those letters to the editor and op-ed columns. And that was just the beginning. A global climate science data center would be set up in Washington, D.C. as a nonprofit educational foundation staffed with professionals on loan from corporations to become a one-stop shop for members of Congress, the media, industry, and all others concerned. This was to be augmented by a national direct outreach and education plan to, quote, educate members of Congress, state officials, industry leadership, and school teachers and students about the uncertainties in climate science. When their own scientists had told them there was no uncertainty, there's unanimous agreement. That was more than 20 years ago, but the consequences of that play out in our lives every single day to this day. Now let me bring you right up to today and then we'll start on the home stretch here. In uh, late July 2017, uh, a document ended up in my inbox uh, from an academic at the University of Alberta named Lori Adkin, and she said, look at this, you've got to read this. And that's, you, I'm not sure you can read the cover there, but across the top, that's the CAP logo, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. And, uh, and this, the document was a policy and regulatory framework. It is, this is not the title for a bestseller. If I had written this, I'd have had a much better title. Anyways, I dug into it. Let's, and these are some of the key points. This is essentially how the industry sees itself in 2017 and 2018 today advancing its interests. 
They want to take a whole of government approach. So they're not talking about just dealing with Department of Energy or Department of Natural Resources or Department of Environment. They want a whole of government approach, everybody involved. Which might explain, by the way, why about three weeks ago there was a small controversy in Alberta when it turned out that the school curriculum on climate change in Alberta is being vetted by the oil industry. <laughs> Seriously, that's a whole of government approach. And they lay out in this document how they want this done. They have an industry government committee that will provide, in their word, oversight. And they name who will be sitting around the big boardroom table at this committee. So leading representatives of the industry, plus the Alberta Premier. They name a number of key ministries they want there. And they specify the Alberta Energy Regulator. Now, best practice would say Alberta Energy Regulator is arm's length. But in the case of Alberta, the Alberta Energy Regulator is actually chaired by an oil executive. And they go beyond this. And I should say, those of you, you probably don't think about the Alberta Energy Regulator. And if you do, go get a better life. But <laughs> once in a while, you need to think about it. It's one of the largest and most important energy regulators in the world because of the scale of Alberta's oil sands resource. It affects your life. The Alberta Energy Regulator is what approves all these expanding oil sands plants that want to ship bitumen down the pipelines. Then this document goes further. They want to engage this way with the federal government, with the NEB, and with the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency. And the purpose of this committee and the oversight from the industry and the uh, government is to ensure policy and regulatory changes that protect and enhance the investment climate for the petroleum industry. When I read this and sort of took it in, I realized this is effectively the organizational structure of oil's deep state. They are treating themselves as equal to government here. And they are bringing each of these different institutions. They name the departments. They name the leader of the governing party. They name the regulators to the table so that they can enhance their interests. So, Everybody suitably down right now? Kind of, okay, there is hope. We have to end with hope, so let's move on. I even spell it on the slide, there is hope, so it must be true. While we in Canada are struggling to, and doing everything we can, including buying a multi-billion dollar pipeline that turns out may never be built, we're trying to hang on to the oil industry much of the rest of the world has got the memo that there really are globally catastrophic effects happening. And they're moving on. Google, 2010, zero renewables, and Google is a massive user of energy. 2017, 100% renewable energy. Other companies, Apple, Facebook, and so on, even companies like Walmart, which is, as far as I know, not the most progressive of companies, but Walmart is shifting to more and more renewables. I think a real game changer is going to begin to unfold next year, like as in six months from now, when all the world's major automakers begin rolling out more and more and more lines of electric cars. Uh, and those won't, I mean, it's beautiful, they're taken up here in BC and Alberta, you don't see them very much. Canada will lag on this because of a failure of leadership. California is leading, Salt Spring Island is leading. Uh, China, China is on the brink of a massive switch. It's already underway in China towards electric vehicles. Uh, it's great for the environment. It will be devastating to Alberta's economy and it's really going to uh, pose a challenge for Canada. We have to remember oil products are typically our most valuable export. The electrical system is getting greened, um, and I do give Rachel Notley credit for this. Coal-fired power plants in Alberta are being phased out. That's happening uh, in various degrees in the U.S. and uh, throughout much of the world. The U.K., which began this whole process 200 years ago by burning coal, often goes an entire day with zero coal 
in their electrical system. And jurisdictions like California and China and Germany and so on are all leading the way while we are dragging further and further behind. So what can we do? Well, all of you came out tonight. You've already made a, a difference just by joining with others and learning a little bit more. There are changes we can make in our personal lives and we are going to have to reprogram, reprogram our lives so that we depend on less and less and ultimately, ultimately no fossil fuels over the next couple of decades. That means changing how we get around, changing how we eat, changing how we holiday. Not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I actually cycle a lot and I find I have more money in my pocket and I'm healthier, I don't get stressed in traffic, and I lose a little bit of weight. It's all good. Engage with your community. Talk, 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 talk. Talk to everybody you encounter about your concerns with global warming and the need to reduce fossil fuels. Turn this into a moral issue. There was a time when slavery, it wasn't a moral issue, it's just what you did. And it became a moral issue through public discourse. There was a time when women's rights were radical. Um, and through conversation, and they became a moral issue, a question of right and wrong and fairness. And we need to do the same thing with our use of fossil fuels. Defend an institution. I'm taking us up another notch here. If you're involved in a labor union, make sure the labor union has a plan to adapt to the future, and, and if it's involved in uh, an industry that relies on fossil fuels, make sure you're beginning to put in place safeguards for workers who are soon going to be declared redundant. And First Nations, political parties, whatever institution you're in, try to get involved with them. And finally, consider getting involved in politics, whether it's working on a campaign, running for office, leading a party, Join a political party. Ultimately, this is a political issue. Sorry, I lost track of, that's my fault. You can just go ahead, three, four, and then the last one, Laura. Sorry about that, folks. So I'm gonna wrap up here. I hope at this point you have a stronger sense of how when you fight for a cleaner environment, when you shift away from using fossil fuels, when you take a stand on a pipeline, you aren't just fighting for the environment, you're also fighting for a stronger, healthier democracy, and, and both of those things are absolutely worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Mike is working, good. Well, Kevin, thank you so very much. Uh, you outlined things that I've seen and you put it in language that was remarkably clear. I, I think for me, a wake up call about capture, and I, I do want to ask you a question, but I just share with, when you put up there the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency and the whole of government approach, it was one of the shocks for me going into the 42nd Parliament, and I thought, oh, you know, I, I obviously have a political view. I'm the leader of a federal political party. But I really thought things were going to be a lot better with Justin Trudeau as Prime Minister, and I have to say they're better than they were under Harper, I think. But I thought we were going to bring back, just as one example, real environmental assessment. And the horror I experienced was in meeting with a senior executive of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, and this is our civil service, and it was right after the election, and the Liberals had promised in the election platform to restore environmental assessment, undo the damage Harper had done in spring of 2012 with Bill C-38. And I was talking to someone in the senior ranks of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, and I said, well, I just hope we can bring in legislation quickly to bring back environmental assessment and get rid of what happened in C-38. And she said, oh, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I said, no baby in that bathwater. That, that's toxic goop. There's no baby there. And I realized 
I think that's the number one reason Catherine McKenna has not fixed our environmental assessment process is that the advisors she has were somehow captured. That the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency in the nine years under Harper reimagines itself as not a regulator in the public interest to assess environmental impacts, but as a concierge service to help corporations get their permits. And I, I, so, so you, I've seen it happening too. How did it happen? What do you think are the elements that allow our public service? These aren't people running for office. They're, they're, they're supposed to be operating solely independently in a nonpartisan way in the public interest. How does it happen? I don't think there's a single answer to that. Um, I mean, you know better than probably anybody in this room how the Harper government changed the nature of the institution. So it, it changed all kinds of legislation to, to make those institutions friendly to the oil industry. The power base for Stephen Harper was Calgary's oil industry. Uh, so the legislation, the rules of those institutions were changed. The regulatory institutions, the Department of Natural Resources, Environment Canada, the scientific agencies not only had their rules changed, they had their budgets chopped. Um, but I think it goes beyond this. Uh, the, the industry, from the perspective of almost anybody in this room, unless there's a multi-billionaire in here, the industry has virtually unlimited resources and I don't use I don't say that lightly so they can spend all the time and money they want uh, doing political lobbying to get legislation changed but at the same time let's say there's influential op-ed pieces or op-ed pieces being written by uh, influential academics I might as well use names here. Jack Mintz, for example. Jack Mintz is a prominent tax lawyer. I bet all, everybody in this room has read a column by Jack Mintz. Jack Mintz was the head of uh, an institute at the University of Calgary for many years and published under that name, and he's a big supporter of the oil industry. What never came out is that he's also a, on the board of directors of Imperial Oil and makes uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year plus from that position. So when you read that, and when the civil servants read that, and civil servants are humans, or when they go home and talk to their spouse about it, they're shaped by that. And they're shaped by uh, all kinds of those, uh, those strategies that are used by the industry to get us all into a mindset that allows Stephen Harper to put through the legislation he does. And the fact that you said that in the present tense is even more chilling. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to ask you maybe a, a, a hard personal question because in, I know that in opposition in Alberta, you overlapped in your time there with Rachel Notley and you have written about sharing with her a lot of the same analysis that mm -hmm. the oil industry, well, I think many people in this room will know that the oil industry in Alberta has the lowest royalty rates in the world, set by Ralph Klein, far below those in other countries, uh, and that they have lax regulation, that they've been, well, the, the analysis was that we should be refining more in Alberta, charge proper royalty rates, going back to Peter Lougheed's notion that if you have a resource economy, you need to think like an owner. What on earth has happened to Rachel Notley, and do you have any, any explanation or thoughts I get that question over and over and over again, and I get it from many people in, in Alberta, um, because what they see, the, the woman they see in, as the Premier is not apparently the woman they voted for. Somebody last night said, as, it's like that old science fiction movie, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You have the appearance of Rachel Notley, but is that really Rachel Notley in there? Um, I was thrilled when Rachel won the election. Uh, I thought, wow, this is a good step forward. But on election night, when I listened to her victory speech, she was already saying, and I want to reassure my friends in the oil industry, we will work with you. She said it again the next morning, and 
and, and that carried on right from the beginning. My belief is that in the days leading up to the actual vote, their polling told them they were going to win. The, the polling also told the oil industry the New Democrats were going to win, and that uh, she was immediately under pressure, even before she'd actually won, to get in line with the industry. And that pressure would have come from direct meetings with the most powerful executives who can rearrange a line item in one of their budgets and lay a thousand people off. But it would have also come from her most senior civil servants who were all there with close ties to the oil industry. It would have come from the members of the, the staff of the regulator who reported to a, a man who is a, 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 is, is a executive from the oil industry. So she, everywhere she turned, the message would have been the same, get on board with the oil industry. And for her, she didn't really expect to win when the campaign began. She just, she gave up before she started. It was so sad. It's, it's actually tragic. I, I, I agree it's tragic and I, I was also thrilled the night she won. I thought this was going to be a really, and of course, it, it was a great moment to remind people that voter turnout matters because I remember them saying, wow, this was the highest voter turnout in Alberta in, I don't know, it was decades. And it was something pathetic, like 50 some percent. And I thought, boy, it's, you know. So we, when we look at this in solutions, restoring democracy uh, is essential to avoid global catastrophe. And so the tools, of education and sharing with people that we're looking at captured institutions are essential. You gave some tips for what we all need to do and get involved, but in specific terms, what should, for instance, Justin Trudeau do if he were serious? I mean, how, I, mean I, I have my own theory for why we ended up, all of us, aren't we happy speaking of the new baby? We all have a new pipeline, only it's 65 years old and leaking, but so we all own it together. But I still find it astonishing that has happened, but I don't write off that, that they should be aware that this is not what they promised, and there should be a level of deep unease with that, both within Rachel Notley's government, although they face an election sooner, and with Justin Trudeau. What would you advise them to do, or any leader to do in a democracy, to liberate that that has been captured, if they wanted to? You're asking really tough questions here, Elizabeth. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, specifically on the pipe, listen, one of the reasons I did that background science is to get to the point which is, I hope is absolutely clear in your minds, we have to get to zero emissions. Zero. None. We're already way past the danger level. We have to get to zero. And that just reinforces the message that Justin Trudeau has been told, I'm sure by you and a million other people, you cannot expand oil sands production and fight global warming at the same time. That is not a safe straddle to make. And I, I, I've never met Justin Trudeau. I've no doubt that he was sincere when he was elected. There were alarm signals in the last day of his election. I don't know how many of people would remember or even notice, but there was a sort of a little scandalette about four days before Justin Trudeau won the election when the co-chair of his federal election campaign had to resign. And he's a man named Daniel Gagne, again, very accomplished man. These are, these are bright, bright people. He's a little, he's a character in the book. He had to resign because he was caught sending emails to the oil industry saying there's going to be a change of government, let, let us, let our team, and it's never quite clear what the team is, help you adapt to this change. So right away, I mean that gives you a sense of how Justin Trudeau was hemmed in before he even started. Uh, if I was to give him advice, I mean, it was terrible that he, he bought this pipeline, in my mind. Uh, I'm not sure there's any way out of it at this point. But what he needs to do is come down squarely on, on addressing global warming. I would even forgive him the pipeline if he said uh, something to the effect that that is the last 
oil project that we are going to see happen in this country. From here on in, we are phasing out the oil industry. Uh, some kind of, uh, he, he's got to, he can't, he can't square the circle he's in right now. I would add to that, the pipeline that we bought, just to, it's not really what you could call good news, but it's slightly reassuring, is that the uh, contract of purchase and sale for the 65-year-old Trans Mountain Pipeline does not include any commitment to build the expansion. That's a political promise. The contract is solely, I mean, it's unbelievable, $4.5 billion for a pipeline that's worth much less, but it doesn't commit Canada to doing the expansion. That's a political pledge and one I hope they, ca they can never reach. But I do think that his, in his early days as Prime Minister, and I was in the room at Globe in 2016, when he said, we've got to phase out the fossil fuel industry. And almost immediately, the, there was a backtracking because a lot of people landed hard on him. And unfortunately, not enough people heard him say the positive thing yeah. to rally around and say, good for you, that's what you should be saying. So he got, uh, it, it's, a, it's a politically tragic situation yes. we're in right now. And we have, obviously, we're running out of time and I, on the climate crisis. We know that uh, those decades that you sketched out, and I lived through those decades where the Rio Earth Summit to me was disappointing because the framework convention on climate change was too weak. But I, my friend Jim McNeil, who'd been Secretary General of the Brundtland Commission, identified just what you did. He said 1992 in the Earth Summit, he, called, he, he, he described it this way, that's when the Carbon Club was formed. That's when they decided to push back, not accept action to reduce global warming. Even though we'd just gone through fighting acid rain and we had a treaty to protect the ozone layer and it had gone through, the fossil fuel lobby proved to be, and I don't know that you, you use the word cynical, uh, but Kevin, at what point do we describe their actions as criminal? Oh, I, I don't doubt. <laughs> I don't I don't doubt that in the future, um, some of these actions will, will turn out to be judged as criminal actions. I mean, there are, you probably all know, there have been a whole series of uh, attempts in the United States to, to bring these issues to criminal court or to civil courts. Not very many of those have succeeded, but eventually, I think they will. Um, the question, the word that comes to my mind is when I'm, I'm very reluctant to use the word evil. I take the word evil really seriously. And uh, so, but at some point there is, there is a streak of evil in putting your own company's corporate interests ahead of, ahead of humanity. humanity, yeah. Ahead of your own children. Uh, yeah. So we're gonna switch gears now. Francis is going to help us because Thomas has been collating and looking at questions. So Francis is well, the yeah, question lady. Yeah, I've got lady. a stack of them. It's, there's quite a few here. So um, yes, and I just wanted to explain to everybody that if you have a question, you can write it on the back of your program and pass it to the end of the aisle or just wave it and someone will come and collect it. There's people to collect them. Or you can text uh, if you have a cell phone to 778 you're all writing this down who have cell phones, 350-0906. Okay, and please keep your questions brief and to the point. Um, I'm going to start with a few of the questions that have already been handed to me, and we'll just keep rolling as much, uh, we'll get as many as done as we can. Okay, so um, this one is from uh, a cell phone with the last four digits, 8995, there's no name, but the question was, would Alberta be wealthy if they cleaned up after the oil industry? This is a topic that doesn't get much public profile at all. The liabilities of cleaning up the oil industry in Alberta, uh, the Alberta Energy Regulator very quietly estimates them at roughly $260 billion, which is greater than the net debt of Quebec and virtually none of that is covered by any savings from the oil industry. It's like 
there's been a huge, it's like you had a frat group come over and have a wild party in your basement and you forgot, forgot to collect the damage deposit. Um, so when the, I, I, I assume this is what the question was about, those finances I think could actually crush, crush the public uh, finances of Alberta. A little footnote of history, the only province in Canadian history to default on its public debt was Alberta in 1936. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a 100th anniversary of that event because of these liabilities. Well, and just think of all the money that can be put towards uh, renewable energy projects, right? I mean, oh my goodness. Okay, um, cell ending in 0903 asked, can individuals, uh, or said, individuals cannot stop global warming. So how can we stop industry control of our democracy? Uh, Kevin just said I'm to take this one, uh, but we hadn't heard it yet. Let me just say, I would say that it's not the case that individuals can't stop global warming because it's a project of all of us. So yes, governments as institutions, and ideally we'd have political leadership that inspired action at all levels, including all those actors that, that Kevin's mentioned, media, universities, all political parties, but citizens can make an enormous difference. In fact, without citizen action, uh, nothing will work to respond to the climate crisis, and we still have time, I want to emphasize this a lot, we still have time to avoid the worst of the climate crisis. We still have time to get to what Kevin is, has identified as essential, and I would say not only zero carbon, we have to get to negative carbon. We have to be so restoring the sequestration capacities of forests around the world. We have to even, I mean, there are, there's work technologically, as you know, to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. We have to get to, to, neg to carbon emissions that are on the negative end so that we are doing as much as possible to have, we have to avoid, uh, I'd say, we have to avoid emissions that lead to more than 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase. Now, we can restore democracy and we can fight climate change, and any action taken on one helps both. That, that's a key message. Citizen engagement and recognizing that you can make a difference on the climate crisis will engage you more in the actions of rescuing democracy. And uh, some of you will remember I did a speaking tour a few years back because Harper prorogued, so I had time to run a speaking tour. But I called it Rescuing Democracy from Politics. <laughs> uh, and one of the things we can all do is make sure the referendum passes in British Columbia to bring in proportional representation. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Okay, number 5303 asked, is it possible to free our democracy entirely from private interests while we have a profit-driven capitalist economy? Or do we need a new system? This is the profound question under all of this, and I, I don't mind saying that we need to seriously question capitalism. We need to, uh, we need, and this is just me speaking, I'm not an active with any political party, but we, we need to understand that markets are not the answer to all kinds of problems. Markets are very good and very limited capacity. They have to be managed, they have to be controlled. And we have to understand that we cannot have unlimited growth on a limited planet. It just isn't going to work. So until we, in many ways, until we address these, or in the course of addressing global warming, we're also going to be forced to address some of the issues that, uh, that our capitalist economy is generating. Thank you. Um, in the Seashell area, number 8104 said, what can you say about the purchase of the pipeline? I know you've already talked quite a bit about it, but if you'd like to add anything. It was a, it was a terrible mistake. Can I, I'll just throw out that I think, uh, because it's the first time I've been seeing many of you since this whole craziness happened, I actually believe that Kinder Morgan recognized in the Trudeau administration a bunch of suckers that they could fleece. I think they, they, and I think it was a rut that the Trudeau folks, and I know you came here to hear Kevin, so forgive me, but I think every time they tried to defend the idea that they'd made this initially backroom deal, which then became a grand bargain, 
we'll give Rachel Notley the Kinder Morgan pipeline and then she'll go along with a climate plan, even though her climate plan was a massive increase in greenhouse gases from 70 megatons a year to a cap at 100 megatons a year from the oil sands. The, what was a backroom deal became a public thing and more that the conservatives and Albert, Albertans, Albertans like Jason Kenney said to Trudeau and, and Andrew Scheer in the House, you guys aren't serious about building the pipeline. It isn't being built. The more that every time Trudeau and Jim Carr and Bill Morneau got up in the house and said, the pipeline will be built. We will build that pipeline. And I could think, what is, what are the, there's these court cases. And I go up to the efforts and say, don't you realize you might lose the court cases? Where, what, what happened to the politicians' default weasel words? The matter is before the courts. What, what are you guys doing? And they say, pipeline will be built. The pipeline must be built. Ah, Kinder Morgan thought, oh, we can tell them we'll kidnap our own project and hold it for ransom. If they don't guarantee we can build it, we're out of here because guess what? Kinder Morgan wanted to go anyway. And to avoid a press conference that they thought would be really embarrassing, Bill Morneau ended up saying, what will you take to leave here and say we did a good job? Oh, we have to buy the old pipeline? which was never in contention, not a debate. It's, the we it's, it's going to go down as one of the political blunders of, of historic proportions in Canada and also an economic disaster. Well said. Okay. Claire asks, many people are concerned about their investments. Where should people invest to support or reduce CO2 emissions? What pressure and direction should be coming from financial institutions? This is part of, a, this is, this is part of the work that you can do, the effort you can make as an individual, or if you're with, a uni, say, a university, or if, you have, uh, if you've worked with a government and you have government pension funds, there is a global campaign, you probably all know about divesting from fossil fuel companies, about, in other words, people pulling their investments out of fossil fuel companies. And um, people can do that individually. You can do that if you have, uh, you know, if you're in a mutual fund or so on, you can shop around for those that do not invest in fossil fuel industries or other unethical industries. And on a much larger scale, you can go and meet with the management board of your pension fund, or uh, go to your university if you're at the university and, and uh, press them at the board of governors level to withdraw from, uh, from fossil fuel industries. There's already a lot of this happening. Stanford University has done it. Organizations around the world have done it. Even the Rockefellers, the Rockefeller Foundation has pulled all of its money out of the fossil fuel industry. Wow. Okay. Brendan in Whistler uh, has asked, what is, the, what is a highly reliable, trustworthy resource for inf information on climate change? Uh, it depends how technical Brendan wants to get. I mean, if, if he's, he's really serious, then I would advise spending some time with the reports of the IPCC, the Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and those are on the web and they come in sort of short summaries and long summaries and then the massive reports. But there are, um, Yale University has an excellent site, the um, Royal Society in Britain has an excellent site. I was going to say IPCC as well, but I, there's also a very good uh, online source. Well, the In International Institute for Sustainable Development, which is Canadian, has a source called Earth Negotiations Bulletin. And every time there's a climate conference, if you want to know what's going on, you just check in at Earth Negotiations Bulletin or go on their free subscription list. And you get really good detailed reports from scientific conferences, summaries from negotiations as they take place. Uh, there's there, and by the way, coming up next month, so I know a lot of you are active letter writers and pay attention to getting things in the Times Colonist and the Globe and Mail. In October, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report called the Pathway, 
pathways to 1.5 is going to come out. It was mandated by the climate negotiations in Paris in 2015, because once the treaty said that our goal was to hold global average temperature to no more than 1.5 degrees, then the governments sitting in the room happened to know that the current commitments for reductions take us to between 2.6 and 3.4. So how do you get to 1.5? The report, how do we get to 1.5, is coming out next month. And due to the capture of our national media outlets, all of them, I don't know how much attention it will get. So please watch for it and help amplify whatever the IPCC is saying about that, because it's a critical report and a moment for Trudeau and company to do a mid-course correction because Canada's current climate target is inconsistent with the Paris target. It is incompatible with the Paris target, although our media universally refers to it as the Paris target. I think a lot of you here know it was the target tabled in May of 2015 by Leona Aglukuk, Harper's environment minister, and is unchanged since then. Can you speak to the strategy of West Coast environmental law to enact a legal framework to assess and seek compensation of costs associated with the oil industry, i.e. health costs? All I say is it's a great... Everything and anything that can be done, I think one of the ways that we need to identify the climate threat is as a health threat. Climate change is a health issue, we all experienced it this summer because we couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. The Lyme disease epidemic is a climate change health issue. So yes, going after the industry for many of the costs that they assume they can dump on all of us is a good strategy. But whether, it, you know, whether a legal strategy, will, as a former lawyer, I think it's very hard to, particularly Canadian courts are loath to be creative. Uh, I will say since I've got the mic and talking about the courts, and, and Kevin just mentioned the two big court cases recently, the Kinder Morgan case and then the judge in Ontario striking down Doug Ford's uh, law to cut the Toronto City Council in half. The abuse of the courts politically since those decisions came down has chilled me more than almost any development in politics in a very long time. Not since Stephen Harper took aim at Beverly McLaughlin have I so worried that our democracy was going off track, because no one should attack a court for a decision you don't like. You don't say, as Jason Kenney did, they don't care about oil workers. I mean, so that's, that's one of the institutions so far that isn't captured, is our courts. Um, why, who might be allies in addressing the capture? Insurance companies, churches, pension funds, students? I mean, I know we've talked to discuss some of this, but is, are there other? Th those are all good allies. The question was, who is the allies? I mean, yeah. the insurance companies are an interesting force for decades. They've, they've been raising real concerns about the effects of global warming because they, it increases their risks. Uh, in fact, I was told yesterday in Salt Spring that it's become very difficult to get fire insurance for houses now because of um, the fire risk. So the insurance industry, students, seniors, um, I think this is a process where there will be a, a kind of a tipping. I could be dreaming this, but I think that the, the pressure, pressure for change from all those and other organizations will build and build and reluctantly maybe at first another, the Chamber of Commerce might get inside or a, a union might get inside and then eventually it'll cross a line and everybody will want to be on side with addressing global warming. And it will become a moral issue. And you will be seen, uh, I will be seen, for example, if I'm driving around in a big V8 as a moral offender. And it will come to that point. What percentage of the GDP is from Canada's oil industry? <laughs> You know, I should know that off the... Do you know the, off yeah. the top of your head? Well, okay. the, at the height of the of oil sands specifically, as opposed to the oil industry overall, the oil sands at their height, when oil was selling for more than $100 a barrel, was a little less than 3% of GDP, roughly the same as our national tourism industry. But the overall oil industry is about 7% of GDP, I think. Because that includes Hibernia, lots of other places where we're oil producers. 
to, to come at that question just a little bit differently, I was, um, in preparing this presentation, I asked myself globally, if the global oil industry, or let me refer the global fossil fuel industry, so including coal, were a country, where would its economic activity rank in the list of countries? And actually, it wasn't that hard to put together a credible response, and it would rank number three behind the US and China. So the global fossil fuel industry economically is bigger than Germany, it's bigger than Japan, it's way bigger than Canada. So it's, it's very big. <laughs> Is um, Doug Bl Black allowed to write a bill that will allow the Senate to push a pipeline through? Is this not a conflict of interest? Um, I would see it as a conflict of interest. Um, and Douglas Black was just on the radio in Edmonton uh, maybe a week ago, uh, days after the court decision, uh, talking about a letter he had written to the Prime Minister with a point-by-point -point strategy about how to get the pipeline built. Now, it never came out that he had been historically on the payroll of the industry. That never comes out. He's just a senator. Um, I see, you know, I have problems with that, but I guess he doesn't. Okay. Um, Laura McLeod asks, why hasn't oil been refined in Alberta? So there is a lot, there are, just so everybody's clear, bitumen is kind of just like tar. Bitumen has to be upgraded to become crude oil, and then crude oil has to be refined to become gasoline. So there's an extra stage for bitumen. When the first big bitumen plants like Syncrude and Suncor were uh, licensed under the Lougheed government, they were required to upgrade. And that's been to their long-term benefit because they're shipping a very high quality synthetic crude oil to their markets while um, many more recent producers are trying to get this diluted bitumen out. The reason there weren't more upgraders built is that the industry, and this was a heated debate when I was leader of the opposition, the industry felt they could do it cheaper somewhere else. Uh, they felt they could do it cheaper on the Gulf Gulf Coast of Mexico, they thought maybe China or India would build a bunch of upgraders, which they haven't done. And so today, I think industry in many ways is hoist on its own petard. It got caught because if they were shipping a sweet crude oil, they'd actually need fewer pipelines because it's a much smaller volume than diluted bitumen and there would be less environment, you know, the case for environmental opposition would, would be a little less compelling. I think, it, I think it'd be a lot less compelling. In this country in the 19th, I mean, what they say to me now when I say, why don't we refine in Alberta? Why don't we build upgraders in Alberta? On the basis of declining production from the oil sands, but far more jobs per barrel. That's my approach, and I keep trying to get that across. And what I hear as well, it's not economic for Canada. We're too far from markets. So I dug into refining a bit and said, okay, so in the 1970s, were we closer to markets? Because in the 1970s, we had 40 refineries across Canada. We now have 17, I think. And then we're told, oh, Energy East was all about getting Alberta oil to the refineries in eastern Canada, and you terrible environmentalists stopped that. Never mind that it was TransCanada, the proponent that withdrew its application. But it's important for all of you to know that there are no refineries in eastern Canada that can upgrade bitumen. There are more nonsensical things said about the issue of why we have to ship bitumen overseas than on almost any other public policy topic I've ever heard. And back to the media, these are things that a reporter could demolish in a moment. Anytime I talk to reporters in the national media and I explain these things to them over and over again, it never makes it to the rest of Canada that there isn't, no, by the way, back to corporate capture, Scotiabank. I won't use the word evil. I know we have to wrap it up. Scotiabank issued a report that told Canadians that we're losing $40 million a day because the TransCanada pipeline, the, the, the Kinder Morgan expansion isn't built. You need to know that's just, that's absolute bogus nonsense. 
But Scotiabank had already decided to lend Kinder Morgan $2 billion, so it was in on the project and try to help get it built. Was there a conflict of interest there? Yes, there was. Was the Scotiabank report worth the paper it was written on? No, and I won't go on and on about it because you can Google Robin Allen Scotiabank fantasy and you can get all the numbers all written out for you because the economist Robin Allen has done that work. So I'm sure we're going to stop, and besides, you were here to hear Kevin and not me, so I do apologize for a, for a, few, a few momentary, you know, mm. I've fallen off my job as someone mm. to ask him questions. I do apologize. <laughs> All right, we only have time for a couple more questions. We have to move quickly because there are books and there is an opportunity to talk to Kevin. Um, but Google and Apple, um, their zero emissions have been rebuked. And someone was asking if you have some more information around that. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we can't believe everything we hear, and hence there was another question about the media. Uh, you know, why hasn't the broader media picked up on the story? Well, I think that's been answered because it's a bot media. But how, what, what explains CBC? I'm going to ask, did, how many of you were watching the evening news the day that the Kinder Morgan decision came down August 30th? And what's to explain when Andrew Chen turns to Rosie Barton and says, well, maybe this means the pipeline shouldn't be built. And her response, and I'm paraphrasing, was, well, that's not going to happen because if you want a carbon plan, climate plan, you have to have something in return. Oh, boy. Okay, and uh, Kevin, did you send a copy of your book to Justin and Ra Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I know... It at least one environmental group in Alberta has sent Rachel a copy. Mm -hmm. I, I never got a thank you note from her. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe you've given a copy to the Prime Minister. I'm going to buy one tonight and you're going to inscribe it to him. His name is not Chelsea. <laughs> I'll and I will, you hand, know. I will hand deliver it to him. I'll have you know that Creatively United. Yeah. Very good. I'll have you know that Creatively United has delivered several to people in BC's uh, parliament here. So um, please comment on the value of changing our voting system to proportional representation, just real quick, if you can. I think I should turn that to you. I think I did. I, I'll just say that as someone who's, as a citizen, I've always favored proportional representation. When I got involved in politics, which is, which is not a, a fun decision, I have to say, I've come to understand that the toxicity and the nastiness and the, 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 the system of rewards and punishments in politics are designed to reward fake battles over wedge issues and to punish cooperation. And that can be laid at the door of first-past-the-post voting. So if we want a more respectful, decent, consensus-based politics in our legislatures, we change our voting system to proportional representation. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> converted. Last question. Okay, last question. Will tonight's presentation, including the Q&A period, be available for, uh, I can't even read this, for downloading? Yes. It will be, um, and it'll also visit uh, www.kevintafttour.ca. That's where it will be. Is that correct? Okay. So, unfortunately, we can't get through all the questions, and I want to thank you so much for your participation. Um, I just want to, in wrapping up. Uh, just thank you for such an inspired evening and, and even some of the ideas that came forward made me realize that maybe someday we'll have an electric vehicle transit network so we can get rid of our driveways and put in affordable housing in their place and gardens and, and just all the amazing things that we can do. I, there's so much hope. I'm just so excited and, and it's up to us to do and it. And right? Francis, can I just say, because I have been in touch with Kevin Taft now for some weeks or months. months. This is the first time we've gotten to meet, and I just think this is an extraordinary person who gave so much of his life to public service. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. We all want to thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kevin. Woohoo! And do come backstage and get your book signed by Kevin. Thank you.
Don't, do come backstage. There will be book signing. You can talk to Kevin there. And if you want more information on a solutions-based network, visit creativelyunited.org. <laughs>